some of what Pastor Tom was praying was all about compassion, compassionate ministries. Praying for people we've not seen, people we may never see on this side of eternity. But as I was thinking about praying for those that need to be touched around the world, I couldn't help but think about the Lord challenging us to touch the people in our community. And next Sunday, we're going to take a a compassionate ministry challenge pledge where we're trying to support as many uh, compassionate ministries around our area as we possibly can. So I'm I'm just going to remind you of what we talked about last Sunday. Pray heartily, would you please? Lord, speak to my heart about how you would like me to touch the people around us in this community. I think today we're going to look just only at Chapter 4 of Philippians, verse 13. So if you want to just fast forward to verse 13 only, uh, we'll look at that today and again next week. We're going to look at this acrostic today. Uh, There should be a slide, I think, there for imagination is, I can is in an acrostic that we're going to study today and next week. The first letter is I, and that will be imagination. The second letter is C. And that is for commitment. Today we'll look at imagination and commitment. Next week we'll look at assuming responsibility. Uh, By the way, next Sunday is the celebration of Pentecost Sunday. And I would say the church assumed a little responsibility on the day of Pentecost, wouldn't you? Like for the whole world, maybe? And then N is the letter never give up, never quit. Just continue to serve the Lord and work for Him until the day we get to go home. So I can, I can do all things. Look at chapter 4, verse 13 of Philippians today. We've been in this passage for a while, and uh, we have at least two more Sundays after today where we look at specifically Philippians four thirteen and an I can mentality. Paul writes to the church at Philippi, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I can do all that God asks me to do through Him who gives me strength. I can. So today we look at this idea of imagination. What it would be like for us to see what God sees or begin to uh, have an understanding of, of how God might, uh, might want us to think about new ways to do things and an imagination Um, is a wonderful gift from God to us. In fact, we use imagination all the time in almost everything that we do. Uh, Students are captured by a subject and and they can see what it would be like when they are doing that kind of work. So they, they graduate from high school and they go to college with an imagination of what it will be like on that day when they enter into that field that God is opening up for them. And then not too long after that, they'll go, what in the world did I want to do this for? (laughs) Work every day the rest of my life. I should have gone to graduate school. (laughs) Elongated the process. But this idea of what God is opening up for us to do, we have this imagination of what it will look like when we are in that field. Or maybe designers. Um creators, artistic kind of people. I think, first person I think of when I think of designing something is my wife. She's not a classical uh, architect or designer or anything like that, but, but she, she sees things that aren't there. I speak to dead people. No, I don't. Sorry. Name that movie. Never mind. She sees things that aren't there. We buy a house. I think as I walk in, hmm, move in ready. She just looks at me and goes like this. David, David, David. There's stuff we have to do. And she can see it. And she she can actually, in her mind, see how things are going to look. And she says, can you see it? And I go, no. And, And here's the truth. As the most unobservant man who ever walked on the planet, I won't see it after it's done. I just go, oh. That is so lovely. What are we talking about? Imagination. This ability to see it before we see it is also true in our scriptural lives, in our spiritual life. 
individually and collectively. Proverbs says, without a vision, the people perish. The prophet Joel, talking about the emergence or the coming of the Holy Spirit, he he talks about in his uh, scripture, chapter 2, verse 28, he says, I will pour out my spirit on all people and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. And even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I've always been a little perplexed at this age in my life. Am I seeing visions or am I dreaming dreams? (laughs) Because some would say, I'm very old. And others would say, I'm spry, young. I actually, I don't know anybody would say that. In Florida, where I used to live, they said that. But that's, of course, where everybody was 80. And we were young. This is the same scripture that Joel Sights as, a, as an indication that God will open our eyes to see things that we cannot see or things before they happen. God gives us visions and gives us dreams of what it might look like when we're engaged in that kind of ministry that he has in mind for us. It's the same scripture that Peter quotes on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit of God, and isn't that significant when we think about Paul's letter to the Philippians? I can do all things through Christ. Who gives me strength? The infusion of the Spirit of God in our lives gives us an ability to see things even before we physically see things. Westside, you understand that because 10 or so years ago, you knew the Lord was leading you to build a worship sanctuary and a place where we can visit and gather and and, and just have easy fellowship in this building. And we, we saw it before we saw it. Now, what we didn't see was the $2 million it would take to build. (laughs) How's that going to happen, Lord? But you know what? Can I tell you some really good news? Eight and a half years after we've entered into this $2 million addition, we only have $160,000 left on the debt. (laughs) Would anyone today like to just go ahead and finish it off? Not a single amen. Just... Kind of an awkward laugh there. This, this wonderful working of God. We don't know how we're going to pay for it, but God, we believe this is what you want. We see what it will look like. We, we, we even see, Lord, what it will look like when on Sunday after Sunday, we have almost 300 people worshiping in here and another 100 in the other part of the building, 75 to 100 children. And we, we run it, we're running somewhere around 370, 380 people in this it says the occupancy is 348. <laughs> I know how you folks like to sit a little apart from one another. You would really have to think differently to get 348 people in here. You'd have to really like your neighbor. <laughs> Wouldn't it be something? Wouldn't it be something to see 350 people at 9:30 at 11 o'clock and then God just says not enough. Pastor Isaac, would you preach the 130 service? And he says, sure, I don't have anything to do at home. Julie, cover it. Take care of the children. I don't know exactly what God sees, but I have every confidence that through Christ who strengthens us, He will give us an idea of what he sees and what he wants us to accomplish. And we'll begin to see it before we see it. Imagination. This wonderful gift of God. The Holy Spirit is still filling believers 2,000 years after the day of Pentecost. Giving us dreams and visions of what is not yet seen. My question, one of my questions is, can imagination run amok? Can imagination be used for evil? Absolutely it can. Didn't Paul say in Romans chapter 1 that evil-minded people are inventors of evil? I mean, we live in a day and age where almost any expression of wickedness can be out in the public arena. And before you know it, there's a following. And you just go, "How how did this ever take root? How did it? Well, because the one that is opposed to the will of 
the father is creative and imaginative and in the invention of evil and and pathways that lead to things that are in opposition to God and there is a movement in our world today to do everything in opposition to what God says. So the key to imagination and being, being as a positive gift is being in Christ. Through Christ I can do all things. I, I can't, shouldn't even be a part of our vocabulary when talking about what God has in mind for us. Our response ought to be, hey church think, our response ought to be, yes Lord, yes to your will and to your way. Yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me with my whole heart, I'll agree. And my answer will be, some of you have been in church before. To think about how the response to Jesus would be, yes, that's what I'll do. I'd be willing to do that. Lord, when your spirit speaks to me. Showing me what you, what to do, where to go, how to follow. Trust me, the Lord says. Trust me. My response would be, yes, Lord, I, I can do all things through you who gives me strength. Not I can't, but I can. I can. What if the negative Nellies and all the naysayers had convinced imaginative, creative people that they can't do something? For instance, what if they, and here's a negative person from a long time ago. His name was Lord Calvin, a British mathematician, a physicist. He said in 1895, heavier than air flying machines are impossible. Hmm. How many flights are taking off today? around the world in those heavier than air flying machines but Lord Calvin was convinced it would never happen Business Week said on August 2nd 1968 with over 50 foreign cars already on sale in the United States the Business Week magazine said the Japanese car industry will never carve out a slice in the United States market I believe my wife drove today in our Honda Fit Hmm. They, Harvard Economic Society, in, on November 16th, 1929, note the date, November 16th, 1929, Harvard Economic Society says, quote, a severe depression like that of 1921 is outside the realm of possibility. Hmm. They might have missed it a little bit there. They... Thomas Watson, chairman of IBM in 1943, he said this, I think there is a world market for about five computers. <laughs> they, Ken Olson, president of Digital Equipment Corporation in 1977, said, quote, There is no reason for any person to ever own a computer in their home. <laughs> Naysayers. They, Frank Knox, the Secretary of the Navy, on December 4th, 1941, said, Whatever will happen, the U.S. Navy will not be caught napping. Three days before Pearl Harbor. Perhaps my favorite one is this. Now, listen carefully. Union General John B. Sedgwick while observing the Confederate Army positions in the 1864 Battle of Spotsylvania, said, quote, They couldn't hit an elephant at this... Di <laughs> it's my favorite quote of all time. He didn't even get to finish distance. <laughs> Naysayers. Can I say to you this morning, naysayers know nothing. They are wrong and especially wrong about what we can do in Christ who gives us strength. There is nothing that we cannot do through Jesus Christ who gives us strength. I can do all things, Paul says to the Philippians. He is not only talking about himself 
individually. I have come to understand that through Christ's power in me, I can do all things. I can encounter things of, of suffering and tribulation and hardship. I can be in prison for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can be set free to establish churches because of Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But he's not just talking about himself. He's talking about the entire church to whom he writes. He's talking about West Side collectively. There's nothing that Christ cannot give us the strength to do and accomplish. We don't have to see how it's going to happen in order to know that God sees how it's going to happen. And we trust him long before we ever see it. We trust him to bring it to be. I can do all things because I have this ability through Christ to trust him more. Dream the dream. Ask the Lord to reveal his will, his plan. Ask him to guard it until it becomes what it is to become. Not only will I see it when it happens, but I will see him in the process of making it happen. And by the way, it isn't us who does anything anyhow. It really isn't about you and me. It is absolutely about him being able to do what he has in mind to do. The second letter is C, commitment. Of this I can mentality, I have an imagination, but I also have to make a commitment. What is God asking us to commit to? To that which has already happened or to that which is yet to happen? The answer is yes. <laughs> Both. It is the wise person that recognizes the things God has done in the past and says, oh, thank you, God. And then translates that into a, why if God works in the past, would he not continue to work today? There's a marriage between what has happened in the past and what happens today. There's great stability and foundation in that, that the God who was working yesterday is still working today, and there's great solace in realizing he has every intention of working tomorrow. Same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Or which work, art, and something else shall be. That's a little King James there for you. Every now and then, I like to whip it outeth. So, so I'm sorry. I don't think whippeth is in the King James <laughs> translation. Commit to the truth already given to you. That is so significant in our lives that we don't have to be told the truth of God again and again and again to believe the validity of it. He gives us the truth. We establish our lives upon it. It becomes foundational in the decisions that we make. The question is, can we commit to what he gives us? Committing ourselves to the truth is essential in going forward and, and having confidence that he has this idea for us, this foundation upon which we build our lives. But it, I believe the harder commitment is to that which is before us because we don't see how it's going to resolve. And can I say this to you this morning? Commitment has a price tag. Everything. I mean, all out, abandoned over to the will of God so that his kingdom would come and his will would be done in my life. And, and, and it, leaves, it leaves the ambiguity out of the equation. I, I'll give you what I can see or what I can understand when the reality is just a, a, an all out abandonment over to God is required. Living for Jesus is not a part-time job. It's not an on-again, off-again thing. It's not a hobby. 
It's a commitment. In Proverbs, Solomon says in chapter 16, verse 3, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. David says in Psalm 37, 5 and 6, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. But you see the requirement there? It can't be a half-hearted confidence or commitment. It's an all-out abandonment to the will of God. The song we used to sing says, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No. I'm pretty sure that conversion, when we become alive in Christ Jesus, it requires a death to ourselves. It requires that I come to this place, that I recognize that I have to die so that he can reign in me. So I come to this place where Tom was praying about the grace and we were singing about the grace that abounds where sin runs deep. Praise be to God. The depth of sin on this planet doesn't begin to measure the grace of God. No matter what we find ourselves in or where we find ourselves, we find ourselves at this place of grace, this point of grace where we fall before the Lord Jesus Christ and we confess to him, oh God, my sin runs deep. The things of my life that are askew and wrong, oh God, would you please forgive me for my sins? And the scripture says he is faithful and just to not only forgive you of your sins, but to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And you rise up from that confession and you recognize that your heart has been made new. You recognize that the grace of God has completely forgiven you and erased all the past. Oh, it's so nice to know that the past is no longer affixed to my name. But to rise up from that point of grace, you cannot continue to live the way that you did. That is not conversion. That is guilt release. Oh God, I don't want to feel this thing, so would you please take that away? And then you rise up and continue to live the same way that you did. That is not conversion. Conversion is when you cry out to God and the grace forgives you of your sins and cleanses you. And you rise up and you walk a brand new way. You change your life because now you have a new foundation of truth. You have a new standard by which you live. And so you realize that the scripture is true. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And you get this opportunity to live your life in the newness of Jesus Christ. That will not happen with a half-hearted commitment. That will only happen if we abandon ourselves over to the Christ who through him can do all things in us. Forgive our past and give us a brand new life and a future, a plan not to harm us. (laughs) but to give us hope (laughs) and give us new life. There is no turning back regardless of the difficulty we encounter. Our commitment is to go forward and to embrace the dream. My question in closing this morning is, what's it going to take to reach, as I shared with you last Sunday, the 200 million Americans who are not engaged in faith? 
not living for Christ, most many have no desire to. What are we, what's it going to take for us to be a part of that generation that reaches over 200 million people who don't know Jesus or have any concept of living by faith? I'm convinced it's going to take a new commitment to overcome every obstacle along the way. It's going to take a belief that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's going to take a new dream, Lord, a new vision, a new way of doing things. Cemented in our hearts, oh God, inspire us to give everything we have to see it become what you want to make it. Commitment has a price tag. Everything we are committed over to God's will brings me to a prayer this morning. Dear Lord, show me what you want to do. Dear Lord, show us what you want us to do. Imagination and commitment. Two vital concepts in realizing this great truth that Paul writes to the Philippian church. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Heavenly Father, this morning, we thank you for challenging our hearts to think about you in new ways. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We realize, Lord Jesus, 2,000 years ago when the Holy Spirit came upon this earth, filled the lives of the believers, you turned the world upside down. And we are the benefactors, Lord Jesus, of your sweet Holy Spirit that is alive and active today in our midst. We could not possibly be what you want us to be and Live in any way right with you, Jesus, without your Holy Spirit opening our eyes up to you, filling our hearts up with you. So we pray, Lord Jesus, as we leave this place today, we will live, leave realizing that the Spirit of God has filled our hearts completely with himself so that we can indeed do what you have in mind for us to do today and tomorrow and for the rest of our lives until that day, Lord Jesus, we catch our first glimpse of you in glory. What a day that's going to be, Jesus. Thank you for not cloaking yourself from us now, but giving us vision and sight. We praise your name today, Jesus, for who you are. In your name, amen. God bless you.